Hi folks, it's Andy, the Analytical Preacher. This podcast, I want to talk about some Christian guidelines, some Christian suggestions for having a strong marriage. In the last podcast, we talked about relationships, but we really focused more on the friendship aspect of our relationships. I think it's worth listening to that podcast if you've not heard it, because as I think most of us would agree, friendship, a strong friendship really is the best basis for a strong and successful marriage. And so there's probably some ideas in the friendship relationship podcast of value, but I'm going to, I'm going to focus in this one specifically on the marriage relationship. And I have to tell you, when you speak with individuals who are struggling in their marriage, it's always such a shame because a good bit of the advice that preachers give really needs to be absorbed before you are married. And so once you're married and you've violated all the rules going in, it does make it much tougher, I think. So some of this will be best understood in a pre-marriage relationship. And then we'll talk about some things you can do inside your marriage as well. The first thing is simply this. There are still in the world today, there are arranged marriages where the parents or the families or the community essentially determines or has a heavy say in who marries who. It always surprises Americans that the divorce rate for these arranged marriages. So let's say that you are in an arranged marriage in a foreign country, in another country. You move to the United States. Individuals that move into the United States who were part of an arranged marriage, their divorce rate is significantly lower than the divorce rate of Americans. And people always find that so amazing. One person said to me when they saw the numbers, does it just mean we're not very good at picking our spouses? What's going on? I said, it almost does mean that, yes, because I think here's what happens. And, so, and here's sort of the first thing I think we have to understand when it comes to marriage. To choose a spouse, you really need to choose the person that you most want to make happy in life, as opposed to the person that you think can benefit you the most in life. And you may choose the best looking person, the person that makes the most money, the person that's going to make your friends the most jealous. All bad ideas, all superficial ideas. You want to pick the person that you want to make the happiest in life. That's probably the best spouse. When we go into a marriage saying, I married this person because on my arm, they're going to look trophy wife, trophy husband. I married this person because their money's going to buy me security and so forth. You're going into that marriage saying, I'm looking to get this out of the marriage. And then at the slightest hint of trouble, that foundation crumbles. In the arranged marriages, they both tend to go in saying, it is what it is. This marriage is what it is. And what I need to do is try to be the best partner that I can be in order to make this marriage work out. And just that slight change of attitude about what you're going into this relationship as and what you're hoping to get out of this relationship makes all the long run difference in terms of divorce. So you do have to be careful and say, I'm not selfishly choosing someone for my satisfaction, I've actually found the person in life that I want to make the most happy. Now, for Christians, obviously, you need to be dating and marrying only people of your faith. The Bible says that very clearly, Old Testament and New Testament. Paul tells us we should not be unequally yoked together in marriage with a non-believer. So if you are a Christian today, then you should be seeking out a Christian partner today. But here's a few things that I think run counter to our society. The Bible would suggest it, and even modern experience suggests it. And, and here's one, and it's probably the biggie. The first thing you want to do if you want your marriage to last, if you want it to be in for the long haul, do not live together before marriage. And I understand, I've had a thousand people tell me this, but it's going to help us work out the kinks before we tie the knot. It's going to actually help us uncover whether we're really even compatible 
or not. How horrible would it be if we got married, find out we weren't that compatible? Folks, it absolutely simply does not work that way. All of my experience as a minister, all of my experience conclusively shows, definitively shows that is a, the fastest way to wreck your marriage is to live together before you are married. And there are statistics that you can see on this from a number of places. There's a project called the National Marriage Project, and I believe it's sort of sort of a combined work between Rutgers University and the University of Virginia. They've compiled a lot of information. This is not a religious undertaking. It's an academic research undertaking. But their data shows, in other ways beyond this, their data shows often what the Bible or a Christian minister would suggest. And living together beforehand actually is harmful for the marriage. And so couples who did not live together beforehand have a lower divorce rate than couples who did live together, even though the couples who lived together, often their justification was, we wanted to make sure we were compatible, work out any kinks before we did this. Very similar along the same lines, having sex, or the more often you have sex with your partner before marriage, increases the likelihood that the marriage will not survive. It's just, the facts are just as black and white and just as simple as that. More so, the more number of sexual partners you have before you get married is directly related to, again, my experience just screams this in working with married individuals. The more sexual partners you have before marriage directly related to how satisfactory your marriage will be and the divorce rate. And again, I think rationally people say, but I need to know if me and this person are sexually compatible. If we're not, maybe we shouldn't even get. If you found the person that you most want to make happy in life and they believe that you're the person they most want to make, they're, you're willing to sacrifice for their happiness and you found that they're willing to sacrifice for your happiness, trust me, your sexual compatibility is not going to be an issue. It's just not. And so many people have this insane idea that if they sow their oats, if they get it out of their system to have as many sexual partners as they can cram in before they get married, that it's going to make them more faithful in marriage. Biology says, the Bible says exactly the opposite. It creates within you a pattern, a habit, a desire to have sex outside of that one partner. I'm telling you, you can argue with me and say rationally it doesn't seem right. And I'm telling you, you are wrong. The more sexual partners you have, the less likely your marriage is going to be successful. And the more times you have sex with that partner before you are married, the less likely your marriage is to be successful. That is just the facts as they exist. I also say to couples, it doesn't matter if they're premarital counseling or if they've been married for 30 years people need to be involved in something bigger than themselves the bible just is relentless in pounding us that we cannot be self-focused and that it seems like we need to take care of number one we need to worry about our happiness and it doesn't work. And the more we try to make ourselves happy, the more restless we seem to become, the more we worry about focus on ourselves, the higher our anxiety and stress levels seem to get. And so the Bible says, find that spouse, have those children that you can focus on as opposed to just focusing on you and see if you don't end up a lot better off. But beyond that, with your partner, with your husband or with your wife, find something that you can focus on that's bigger than yourself. Now, it's not going to surprise anyone that a minister is going to say that needs to be some church-related activity. Find a foster home you can work with. Find a mission that you can support in a foreign country. There are orphanages and old folks' homes and entities that deal with those who have been rescued from the sex slave trade. Find an 
an entity like that that you can support financially or some other way that you can work with that. Of course, oftentimes for young couples, children become the thing that's bigger than themselves. And as couples tend to pour into their children, especially if they do it equally, it definitely strengthens the marriage. What we have to do, of course, is say eventually our children will grow up and they will become more independent and then they will ultimately move out of the house and have marriages of their own. And so we need to have something that's bigger than ourselves. So maybe it's you work with a humane society or you work with recycling in your community. Again, I would recommend you find a Christian church or a Christian nonprofit organization and you pour some of yourself into something that's outside of you and your spouse and then report back to me in a few months and tell me if that doesn't help improve the strength and the richness of your marriage. I've also heard a number of younger individuals say, so sort of that Gen Z and down, and and it's akin to this, uh, we need to live together before we get married. I need to have sex with as many people as I can before I get married to get that out of my system. It's this idea that we need to wait until we're older to get married. There's not a single uh, case I can think of where that's been true. There's not a single statistic that I can find that in any way supports that. And so I think that's becoming sort of an untested, unquestioned mantra, and it appears to me to be incorrect. If anything, the data from places like this National Marriage Project, if anything, the data would suggest that it might slightly hurt your chances of having a successful long-term marriage the older you are, the longer that you wait. And so don't feel like, well, I need to finish college and maybe get my master's and my husband or my wife, they want to do this or they want to do that first. And so I need to let them live a little so they don't regret. Again, that sounds rational to our mind, but the truth is there's nothing to support that that makes a difference at all. And so when you have found that right, if you're a man, when you found that right Christian woman, when you're a woman, you found that right Christian man, and you that is the person you know that you want to make happy, and you've already determined how you're going to be involved in something that's bigger than the two of you combined, there's really no reason to put off marriage on the hopes that an older, more mature you will be more successful in a marriage. It just There's nothing that backs that up. Let me just close out with a couple of points. Again, I made this in the Friendship Podcast, but I just think it's important. The wisdom literature in the Bible really gives us some clues. Proverbs 15.1, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 17.14, The beginning of strife is like letting out water, so before the quarrel, so quit before the quarrel breaks out. All the writer of Proverbs is saying in these two cases is when we are in an argument, when we have been done wrong by someone, especially someone we love and trust, when we've been done wrong, the anger and the hurt are such that they can really cause us to sabotage an otherwise strong and savable and growing relationship in a moment where we sort of say something we can't take back. And so I talk about the wisdom literature of the Bible, but I remember my grandmother saying those same things. Me and my cousin would be just about to throw punches at each other, and she would say, don't say or do something that you can't take back. Basically, go to your corners. You go to that end of the house. You go outside by the chicken houses and Calm down. And that's exactly what the Bible is saying here. When we are hurt, when we are mad, we're most likely to lash out. We don't have to. We can look at someone we love and say, I think what you did was wrong. We have to talk about this. You have hurt me. You have made me angry. You have broken my trust. It's okay to say any of those things to someone if they've hurt you or made you angry or broken your trust. All Proverbs 15.1 is saying is, There's a way to deliver it that puts the other person in a mood to chat. There's a way to deliver it that immediately puts that other person on the defensive. Don't do that with your spouse. And if you think the anger and passion are welling up to a point that you're both about to say something that you can't take back, then predetermine that you'll take a break. And I actually think it's meaningful, powerful for couples to discuss how will we fight when we fight? How how are we going to do this? How are we going to approach each other? Are we going to write down our issues before we say them out loud? 
How, how are we going to cue each other that it's time to take a break? Here's what we need to do. When we become too enraged, too passionate, too hurt, too mad, our self-focus tends to make us more concerned with winning an argument, with not letting the other person get away with hurting us, with not being the first one to admit that we're wrong. Our passions become so self-focused in those regards that we really care more about winning the argument in that moment, in that heated moment, we care more about winning the argument than we do about saving the relationship. And once we go too far in certain areas, relationships do become very hard to fix or to correct. So let me close with this verse from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. When you've been wronged, you need to approach addressing the issue with your spouse in the best way that you can, in a way that can help resolve the issue without shaming them, without blaming them, without jumping them and making them defensive. Get resolution. You can't continue to be mistreated. You can't continue to have them erode your trust or hurt your feelings or make you angry and think the marriage is going to survive. Address the issues. Do not sit on things and let them boil until they explode. Address your issues, but predetermine how you're going to address them in a meaningful, rational, Christian way. But maybe more important for each of us is to say, we're going to be willing to admit when we are wrong. Let me read Matthew 5, 23, 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus is saying, even if you're on your way to church, but you know you've done something wrong to your spouse, hold on. You may say, yeah, but they did something wrong too. And what do you think Jesus would say? Right. And you're not responsible for what they do. You're only responsible for what you do. If you've done something wrong, whether in response to their wrong or whether what you did wrong caused them to respond to you in a negative way. If you've done something wrong, even if you're on your way to church, go and fix it. Go and admit your fault. Go and ask for forgiveness. Don't worry about who goes first. Don't worry about whether they you deserve to be treated that way. Don't worry about if they're getting away with something. What often happens is neither spouse wants to admit wrong when things have gone awry. And if neither does, then it just continues to fester and ultimately it breaks the marriage apart. When one spouse can admit that they are wrong, then it definitely helps the other spouse to come around to that view as well. And they will almost always then admit that they were wrong. Now, I understand you may be saying, yeah, but if every time I have to be the first one, I understand that. If you try it and if you're honest with it, I don't know that every time you will have to be the first one because, again, it can become a pattern in your marriage that you each are willing to admit that you're wrong. If your spouse is not doing that or has never done that, all I can tell you is you do it first, set the example for them, and then ideally they will follow up on that. I have to say, someone who's been in a marriage for almost 34 years, I think marriage is God's greatest gift to man. I think the one man, one woman, Christian marriage of two people that are trying to make each other happy. They're trying to foster each other's faith. They're trying to walk with each other in Christ. And they're working on something that's bigger than themselves in the kingdom of God. That is the single biggest blessing, human blessing that God has given to us. I strongly recommend a Christian marriage to anyone. I just believe you need to approach it in the right way. You need to take the appropriate steps going in, and you need to remember how to address and support one another when things begin to, at some point, when things begin to break down a little bit so that you can rebuild it from there. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this is Andy.